First, talking a little bit about the environment. So, um, you know, visual computing, you know, has, has you know a big impact on the the um, end user experience. And you know, I like to break it up into three categories: the what's happening on the 3D graphic side, what's happening on the media side, what's happening on the display side, and they all uh, are interrelated in what's happening, but they're all driving different aspects of the graphics architecture and the, uh, both the capabilities and the performance and power that we need to deliver. So for example, on the 3D graphics and gaming side, you know, it's a very large market around PC gaming. You, you, you heard BK talking about it this morning a little bit, you know, that, um, you know, there's also a lot of innovation that's happening in browsers and in the user interfaces in the operating systems that all of them are, are advancing rapidly and are, a really important part of the user experience. The other thing that you've probably seen tons about is that there's a lot of innovation that's happening in the virtual reality and augmented reality space. And all of these are driving needs for more powerful, more efficient uh, uh, 3D capabilities. On the media side, you know, there's also an increase in the, the sophistication and quality of the content of 4K, uh, you know, ultra high de definition, um, higher dynamic range displays, 8K, all of these things are coming in the future, you know, but a, a lot is happening right now. And there's uh, different things that are gonna make use of that content. Users are generating a lot more of their own content, uploading it to YouTube or through Vine or, or other forums. There's a greater use of video conferencing and you know, even tools for manipulating content to be able to do uh, uh, more sophisticated content creation. Uh, all of that is really pushing on the, the need for higher quality codecs and higher throughput in, in uh, encoders and decoders and, and whatnot. And then on the display side, which is really tying together the, the 3D and, and media side, you know, there's a need for more pipes and higher resolution. You know, the, the resolution is just shooting up like, like crazy. You know, it, it's sort of hard to believe that a couple years ago that the typical display was going to be uh, 13 by 7. You know, and now we're up to, to 4K and people are pushing on that aggressively and trying to move on to the next step. And then by the same token, we you know, are as quickly as possible trying to move away from 6-bit uh, panels to 10-bit or 12-bit panels to take advantage of uh, Rec 2020 or, or HDR displays. You know, and then all of this needs to fit in smaller form factors you know, with more flexibility you know, all the way down to uh, head-mounted displays that have high resolution and low latency. So all of these things, these different aspects or these different vectors are really driving what's happening on the graphics architecture side. Now, to make it a little bit trickier still, I'll show this picture also to, to set a little bit of context on what's happening on the uh, form factors and power envelopes. And really the idea that I, I'm trying to get across here is a couple things. One, we're very focused on providing the best possible experiences in uh, in, in mobile form factors, but this very wide range of, of mobile form factors that goes from a couple watts all the way up to, let's call it 50 watts. And we have different parts of the product line. Again, I'm not gonna talk any about specifics of SKUs or anything today, but traditionally we've had, you know, the H series, U series, and Y series, and Intel Atom covering this span. Now, the reason I bring this up is the graphics architecture has to span this. And Yuli mentioned this this morning on the CPU architecture side that um, you know, the configurability in the core and the number of SKUs, the dynamic range that the, that, that the Skylake platform has to address is quite large. And the same is true for graphics. You know, and we're trying to do this with a single architecture that spans from a couple watts all the way up to, to uh, 50 watts. Now, talk a little bit about uh, uh, where we've been to you know, also try to give you an idea about the, you know, how the investment in graphics has been changing at Intel over time. So, um, in 2010, you know, with Iron Lake was really when we started the, the family that we call processor graphics. And by processor graphics, what we mean is graphics that's integrated on the CPU die uh, and forming a larger SOC and taking advantage of latest and greatest process and you know, all that good stuff. And we're on our sixth, sixth generation of doing <laughs> processor graphics. And you can see from this table, um, you know, sort of the kind of investments that are increasing uh, uh, ca capability and capacity that's been added over time. You know, so, you know, for example, we started off, you know, really, you know, building a DirectX 10 part and 
you know, in, in those days, Intel was a little bit more behind the curve that the spec was done, and then you know, a year later, we would come up with the part to the place where we are now, where we're actually in the conversations with Microsoft or the other uh, standards bodies that are doing the APIs and making sure that we the new hardware comes out and is ready to support that API from the, uh, from the day the API comes out. And that's the case for, uh, for DirectX 12 and Skylake. You know, also, we've been increasing the, the uh, performance by a you know, pretty healthy clip. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. But you can see you know, that, that uh, there's a fairly large, if you just jump to the bottom line of the table, uh, increase in the number of gigaflops. And this is not a, a true performance number. This is you just uh, normalize and say the, the uh, architecture is running at a gigahertz, which isn't far from the truth. They're all capable of running around a gigahertz. And it, it, it's sort of how many gigaflops that you can get out of the execution units at that clock rate. And you can see um, in the Broadwell and Skylake, uh, you know, that th these are substantial uh, investments from where we started with, with Iron Lake and, and Sandy Bridge. So what I'm really trying to get across here is that graphics is a key investment from Intel, and, and we are actually still growing it. And one of the ways that Intel measures this, or at least the way I think about it is, um, you know, it's sort of putting your money where your mouth is, which is diarrhea. And so you can look at the progression in how much of the dye is, is consumed by graphics. You know, so if you go back to Sandy Bridge on the, the far left, you, you know, that's a, a four core of a CPU, and then compare that with what we've done on Broadwell, and we have you know two variants of Broadwell that have GT3 with uh, 48 execution units in it. Um, you know that you can see on the right hand side, plus the EDRAM investment. You can see that um, it's it's taking up a pretty healthy amount of the die area, and you know that it's 50 percent or or so. And it really does depend a little bit on what the SKU is and how many uh, how many CPU cores are, are present in, in that. The other thing I'd point out is the number of SKUs is increasing. Yeah, you know, and that. Uh, you know, in the old days, we had a single SKU, or then maybe onto SKU, two SKUs that we have a GT1 and a GT2, and then we introduced a GT3. And you know, we're adding more and more SKUs and changing the architecture to scale up to more points to be able to address that full spectrum of, of power envelopes and form factors. So, from a, another summary from a performance point of view, Kind of every uh, hardware vendor has a version of this slide that talks about the phenomenal increase that they've had over some period of time. And for us, if you look at, you know, from going back to 2006 or 2007 or so, it's by the time we get to Skylake, you know, we're up to 100x improvement you know, as measured by some interesting set of uh, 3D benchmarks. Okay, so that's enough for the context part, and now I'll, I'll start getting into the architecture details. And one of the first things I'll point out is. Um, I'm a bit casual, and I'll interchangeably use Gen 9 and Skylake to, as part of the terminology. Um, yeah, and I'll also do that for Gen 8 and for Broadwell. But technically, what I'm really am talking about is the Gen 9 architecture, which is what's used in the Skylake products. Now, just to give a, a, a quick overview, I am going to walk separately through what's going on on the 3D graphics and rendering side, the media side, and the display side. And there also will be some talks tomorrow that we'll be covering other aspects of these in, in more detail. So I'm not gonna go through all the details of everything, but, but I'll, I'll give you a pretty good idea of what's going on in each of those areas. So on the, the 3D graphics side, you know, the, the big thing we've been trying to, to achieve is increasing the performance that, that, you know, by building bigger and better machines and then making sure that they can run the latest and greatest APIs and the feature sets that go with them. So, you know, we were involved with Microsoft with the design of DirectX 12. We've been involved with Kronos for Vulkan, uh, you know, heavily involved with the design of OpenCL 2.0. Yeah, and all of this is translated into uh, capabilities that are present in Skylake. You know, we've also written a new compiler stack as part of the, the software driver stack for Skylake that is based on LLVM, you know, and has uh, uh, new capabilities, new levels of optimization that we hadn't had in the past in our compiler. You know, and you know, I've already pointed out the, uh, the, the amount of uh, scaling, performance scaling and, and power envelope scaling that we have in the product. On the media side, and Yuli mentioned some of this this morning, that uh, we also you know, have a very strong emphasis on having all day media and being able to uh, uh, do media playback at very low power and be able to do video conferencing and those other scenarios. And we've added more and more fixed function hardware support to to reduce the power, and then we've also done 
more work on power gating, uh, uh, clock gating and power gating the rest of the machine in order to be able to support that. And then also adding support for latest and greatest important codec standards, HVC, you know, ABC, SVC, you know, VPA, and motion JPEG, you know, the whole alphabet soup of, of codecs. Uh, and then another area that we've been investing in is in uh, 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 camera video raw processing. So being able to take uh, uh, data directly off the sensor, you know, high-res data and being able to do sophisticated processing in real time. On the display side, you know, the, all of the display work really is to support more pipes with, with uh, uh, higher resolution and, and all the important standards. So being able to do 4K, multiple 4K, uh, pipes and with additional support to be able to uh, support low power scenarios where the the pipes themselves are composed of multiple planes and be able to composite those together and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in uh, when I get through the display section okay so now I'll start walking through the the basic blocks of, of the gen 9 architecture and you know, so the, the first thing I'll point out, you know, again, besides the standard stuff about it supporting latest and greatest APIs, is that it isn't a radical departure from what we did, from what we had done with Gen 8. You know, that it really is uh, composed of, uh, I'll call it three major pieces. You know, the, on the very far left is the display block, and I'll talk about that at, towards the end. And then in the middle, the on the, the left and top, you know, the L-shaped uh, gray area is the unslice. And then the big chunk in the middle is the slice. And I'll talk about those, you know, uh, a areas in turn you know, as I walk through the different uh, enhancements and uh, performance improvements that we've done in, in each of these. But, but that basic structure is really the same as, as what's in Gen 8. Okay, so first on the unslice. So the unslice, it contains uh, uh, three important pieces. It has the fixed function geometry support. It has the interface to the memory fabric, and Yulia talked a little bit this morning about uh, all the improvements in the memory fabric side. I'll talk some more about that as well. And it also has the fixed function media. And when I get to the media section, I'll talk about that. So right here, I'll just talk a, a little bit about the geometry part that's in the unslice and the improvements that we've done there. And the biggest area of improvement that we've done is really trying to uh, improve the overall throughput. There is some emphasis on doing things for, to support better uh, tessellation throughput, like being able to convert triangle lists into triangle strips automatically and use that to improve call rates or um, you know, also be able to remove redundant uh, computations that would show up if I had to do the uh, uh, triangle list separately in, in the domain shader. Uh, another big piece of what we've done to increase the performance or, or efficiency of the unslice is uh, separate it into its own power and clock domain. And that has a few different advantages. One is it can run at a higher clock if there are cases where um, the slice could run at a slower clock and, and I need more uh, uh, geometry or memory bandwidth uh, performance coming from the unslice. There are also some media cases where um, since the media is located in the unslice, I can power gate off the, the slices themselves and do pure fixed function media, you know, or there are cases where uh, in a multi-slice configuration, I might want to run slice and unslice at, at different rates and, and perhaps have a, a second slice turned off altogether. Okay, so uh, next is really, I'll, I'll go through the pieces of the, of the main block called the, the slice. And the slice is really where all the computational parts happen. The, that's where the shader execution units are. Um, and it's really, broken up into two major pieces. There are things called subslices, and subslices sub have the execution units that, you know, packed in a, in a couple rows, the, the texture sampler, some caches, uh, and, and a piece of the memory interface. And then there's another separate block that's called slice common. And there's a ratio of, of subslices to slice commons that comprise a, a, a slice. We haven't really changed that at all from Gen 8, that there are um, three sub-slices along with one slice common, and that makes up a slice, and then we have one or more slices in, in the machine. So what's important about the, this configuration is that determines things like the ratio of execution units to samplers, and also the, the ratio of, of sub-slices to slice common you know, affects the pixel back end rate. Now we didn't really change much of the configuration, but we did make a bunch of improvements within the sub-slice itself. 
So for example, um, you know, you could argue that maybe we're a little bit late to the party, but our execution units now operate all the time in uh, scalar mode. And before that, you know, some, some of you might have heard this term four by two or uh, uh, one by eight or one by 16 or, or one by 32. And they were referring to whether it was in a uh, short vector mode or whether it was in a pure scalar mode. And you know, up until this point, we had had the uh, geometry processing use the short vector mode, and we'd had pixel processing and the GP GPU processing and some media processing use the, the scalar mode. And we've changed things so now everything is all scalar mode all the time, and that was also tied into the compiler, doing the new compiler stack that uses uh, LLVM. Now, also in Broadwell, we introduced uh, Float 16 support to improve the efficiency of the machine. Sorry, give me a sec. And um, you know, there are some additional enhancements that we've done to try to uh, uh, increase the efficiency or the, uh, the opportunities for making use of Float 16, in particular for being able to mix Float 16 and Float 32 arithmetic together that we don't want to end up having to do extra converts to normalize everything to be float 32 for an operation or, or vice versa to convert everything to float 16. So being able to, to mix the two types of data types together in a single instruction is helpful. We've also improved uh, some aspects of the sampler that uh, you know, we've added support for, for YUV formats like MV12, you know, we increased the performance of it. And then we've also added new API features like the support for finalist resources that you know, is now becoming important for, for DX12 and some of the other APIs and for tile resources. You know, and tile resources is the ability to be able to address extremely large sparse resources and be able to deal with them on a block-by-block on a -block basis instead of having to have the entire uh, resource loaded at once. And for a couple of these features, they there's degrees of, of how much hardware support. And so what happens in Skylake is that we add additional hardware support to make them more efficient, even though it may not change the, uh, the it'll change the, the underlying uh, performance of the, of the implementation, but it doesn't change the capability from an API point of view. Okay, so one of the other big ch changes that we made was to, uh, uh, actually, sorry, I skipped one, uh, talk about uh, the changes that happened in, in Slice Common. So uh, Slice Common is where the rasterization, the Z complex, the pixel backend, alpha blend, you know, all those aspects of the machine are located. And you know, one of the bigger changes that we made was to improve uh, make fairly substantial improvements to the throughput in uh, Slice Common. So for uh, regular pixel fill rate, we had increased it by 30% uh, performance by making it capable of doing uh, eight pixels per clock. And then we'd also increased the alpha blend rate as well. So depending on what the combination of modes are, it can be a 30% to, uh, to a 2x performance improvement. We've also improved the performance it for uh, multi-sampling cases. And in particular, we also added support for 16x uh, uh, multi-sampling. Um, there's some additional features that we added, you know, that come with some of the APIs. And some of these things were things that we had pushed on or, or did some development and then, uh, you know, work with uh, standards bodies to go add them to the APIs. So conservative rasterization was something that we've been working on for a while. Um, uh, render target read, the ability to, to be able to get access to pixel data from a render target at the beginning of a shader. We've done some work on that. And we'd increase the cache sizes, you know, to, to generally help with uh, uh, throughput through the machine. Um, I skipped over this one on lossless color compression, and I have a whole slide on that to talk about w what it is that we're trying to do with that. So for lossless render target compression, the idea is that uh, you can never have enough memory bandwidth in the system is kind of the, the gist of it. And so what we don't want to do is do things that will reduce the, the amount of memory bandwidth that we need. And so this form of compression really isn't about trying to save space at all. It's about trying to reduce the number of memory references that we do. So what we do is we compress the data before, uh, before sending it to memory. And then, um, you know, typically the way it works is that you take some number of cache lines 
uh, two cache lines or four cache lines and reduce it to, to a single cache line. In our case, it's the peak compression ratio comes from reducing two cache lines to one cache line. So it all operates on cache line granularity and it all occupies the same memory footprint. We just keep bits around to indicate whether or not uh, the, the pairs of cache lines are compressed or not. One is if you're in a bandwidth limited situation, if you don't have, for example, EDRAM, in the system and, and the graphics is connected directly to DDR or it's connected to a single channel DDR, um, some you know terrible thing like that, you know, it's going to greatly uh, uh, improve performance just because it will reduce the amount of memory bandwidth that's required. But the second piece of it that's really important is that you know, by reducing the load on DDR, we cannot uh, save power from the memory system and then we can apply that power back to the graphic system and get more performance out of it. So it can improve performance in two different ways. And it really depends on what the SKU configuration is about how much memory bandwidth is available and what kind of DDR and blah, blah, blah is, is in the system. But for an example, for one of the release products, like a uh, uh, K-series SKU with GT2 graphics, you can see a uh, uh, 3 to 11 percent performance improvement across a bunch of, you know, somewhat more memory bandwidth limited workloads. Okay, the next piece I'll talk about, and this part is not brand new for, for Gen 9, that we've done something similar for, for Gen 8, which was the manner in which we go about uh, scaling the machine up. You know, so we've had this notion of GT1 and GT2, and really in Haswell we added the notion of GT3. And the idea here is that um, you know, our unit of scaling in the compute complex is slices. So we add another slice to the machine, and by adding another slice it doubles the number of execution units, the number of samplers, and thus the corresponding amount of, of throughput, you know, doubles the number of of slice common so that I get additional uh, Z stencil and pixel ops that they double as well. You know, but to make that work, there's also uh, load balancing that needs to happen. And so there's a hashing operation that happens to make sure that um, uh, pixel processing load is, is evenly distributed between the slices. Now, the other thing that we do when we increase the number of slices, although it's not automatic, it's a choice that we make is in the unsliced go and increase the amount of, of media fixed function logic. So you can see in this example with the GT2 that the MFX, which contains the codex and the video quality engine, that we, we add two of those, or you know we double the number of those um, in a GT3 configuration. So the other part that, that is new for Skylake is this idea of adding a third slice. It's sort of the, well, two slices is good, three slices must be even better. And, and that there are some caveats with that, like, yes, the, the slice needs to be able to support it. Um, you know, and you know, we have a more complicated hash, but otherwise everything just scales up by the factor of 1.5. I have to apologize, I have a really scratchy throat today for some reason. Now on the Going down, so you know that I can add three slices to scale up, and that will end up give me 72 EUs as my execution unit count. <coughs> On the scaling down, there's a couple reasons why I might want to scale down. One is to reduce power, the other is to reduce cost. And if I've already gone down to a single slice, then I have a choice about what to do to uh, scale down further. I could remove a whole sub slice. And that will change the uh, the sampler throughput, um, you know, as well as the execution unit number. But another choice would be to start altering the contents of a subslice itself and change the number of execution units in that. And that's what we were looking at for this architecture: was to switch to a six to one uh, EU to sampler ratio. And the the you know one of, the benefit of that is that that maintains the 12 texels per clock uh, ratio in the slice, and it also retains the 8 pixels per clock in the back end. And so I get these higher fill, fill rates and sampler rates, you know, at the expense of reducing the the uh, computation rate. Now, also, I mentioned it here as part of low power, but it really is available everywhere. Is adding additional support that from APIs that are somewhat, you know, arguably more low power oriented, like uh, the ASTC texture formats, both uh, LDR and HDR, both, the, both profiles, ETC, 
want to, like these things are available across the entire Skylake architecture and you know, are available to be put in all of the, the SKUs. And also, these changes are you know, relatively easy to absorb in the software, so it's the same software stack that, that works across the entire architecture, or, you know, even if we change, modulate the number of slices or modulate the contents of a, of a sub-slice a little bit. Okay, now mostly I've talked about the 3D processing side so far, um, but I also want to talk a little bit about the, the compute aspects. And there's a, um, a series of investments that you know, really had started with Broadwell and that we've been continuing on. So a big one that we had made was uh, adding uh, shared virtual memory support. And really the progression of that was, first, it was a good idea for GPUs to have the notion of address space, that address space per process, and being able to isolate one application from another application while they're executing on the GPU. That's just good for security, it's good for management, good for a lot of other things. Now the next piece that goes with that is say, well, hey, now that it's got a virtual address space on the GPU, why don't you make that virtual address space be the same as the CPU's virtual address space, and thus you get shared virtual memory. <coughs> then the next piece that comes after that is being able to have uh, consistent caches between what the GPU is seeing and what the CPU is seeing on that address space. And, you know, that is an area that we started doing some work with, uh, you know, as part of the OpenCL 2.0 API investment and the hardware support that goes with it. We've done some work on Broadwell. The big changes that we had improved or done work to improve with on uh, Skylake is improving the efficiency of the cache coherency and the performance through the system. Because again, you know, for many of the reasons that it was good to have cache coherent uh, processor cores and makes it easier to write applications. We believe it also makes it easier to write applications that uh, make use of the GPU and can share the same address space and just a pointer is a pointer and you can point at arbitrary data and then also have it be cache coherent and not have to worry about special synchronization operations or, or anything like that. Now in addition, you know, it, it, we, we saw benefit increasing the size of the L3 cache that uh, get, you know, gets used a lot for GPU -GP operations. Uh, we had also added support for um, uh, a richer set of atomic operations for 32-bit float uh, min-max and uh, compare and exchange operations. And also we had noticed that uh, the workloads were tending to use smaller uh, thread group sizes, so we increased the, the, uh, uh, some, the uh, 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 fineness or the fine greenness of the barriers in shared local memory to improve performance for, for those so the machine would install if, uh, or you know, be with small thread group sizes, it would still take advantage of all of the execution units and threads that were available. Now, one of the bigger changes that we had made was also looking at preemption. And preemption is kind of this uh, complex topic. Because um, what happens with preemption is that, you know, like on the CPU, preemption is really good for responsiveness in the system. If you want to provide uh, um, you know, a reasonably responsive system, have good quality of service, you know, blah, blah, blah. Being able to uh, stop and start things uh, relatively quickly you know, with, with a minimal amount of links, it becomes really important. And, and that's actually a kind of a hard problem in, in graphics. And it really is somewhat dependent on the, the type of the workload itself. For example, in 3D, being able to uh, stop in a dime in the middle of a, of a pixel shader or vertex shader execution, dump all the graphics data and restore it later is a really complicated problem. The place where we've got to, we added this in, in Broadwell in Gen 8, was to the ability to stop on a triangle boundary right, at the beginning of a triangle or between two triangles or between two lines or, or points and be able to preempt and then restore to that point. Now on the compute side, we thought we could do better because there's less fixed function involved on, on pure compute. It really is all about the execution unit state or largely about that. Um, yeah, and so on in Gen 9, what we did for the compute side was added you know, the ability to, to uh, stop execution units on an instruction boundary and be able to restore them. And up until this point, we had to be able to stop and start at the boundary of a kernel, like wait for a complete kernel uh, to finish execution before we could preempt the execution unit. Now, this table here in the middle, which I hope you can read, um, uh, kind of shows the, the difference in response time. So on the left-hand side is what happens with thread group level preemption where I have to wait for kernels to, to uh, finish execution before I can do a preemption. And then on the right-hand side is the difference with mid-thread preemption. And these are with 
you know, a realistic app. So like the very first app is using something like a, uh, is using an Adobe Photoshop uh, that's making use of OpenCL to, to do some of its uh, image processing. And you can see, you know, it, it's four or five uh, milliseconds is the, the latency or the amount of time it will take before I get to the point where I can do uh, preemption. And if I have mid-thread, it's down to 300 microseconds. And with four or five milliseconds, that's something that you can see if you have a touch-based system and you're trying to track things and you've moved from one window to another, you can start noticing things that are on the order of milliseconds. Now, it gets the other factor that plays into this is, you know, performance of machines is really is, so, uh, you know, very dependent on what the power envelope is. So I, I, first I mentioned what the U series, which, you know, that's a 15 to 28 watt range. And the, the and you get that corresponding performance. If you go down to Y series, and if you're thinking about, for example, running in the four and a half watt uh, uh, tune point for Y series, you know, there just isn't the same amount of performance that you would get on the U series. And so having to wait for the compute workload to complete you know, to, to get to the uh, kernel boundary, you know, it takes a lot longer. You can see the, you know, just for the Photoshop case, the 17 to 22 milliseconds instead of the four to six. But then if you flip over to the, um, to doing the instruction level or the, the mid-thread preemption, you know, the numbers are much closer, like the 800 is a lot closer to the 300 microseconds. You know, and so um, having the, the mid-thread preemption becomes even more and more important to have on the, the, uh, um, the lower TDP platforms because they just don't have as much raw performance, even though we'll keep trying to get that performance as high as we can. And what this does is it's, you know, having this kind of preemption and, and this quality of service sets the stage for using the GPU compute for more mission critical functions in the system. For example, you know, I already mentioned touch, but that is a, something that we very much have in mind is being able to offload touch processing onto the GPU and be able to do that in a way where it doesn't uh, 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 impact the, the user's experience and that I get good quality of service, but I get all of the resources of the GPU that I can apply to touch processing. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about uh, media improvements. So the, you know, the big story here is the things that we've done on the fixed function media. And Yuli mentioned this morning that, uh, that you know, we've done a lot of work to try to improve the power aspects. I mentioned before that uh, you know, we've got the media fixed function is in the unslice and we've got separate power and uh, uh, clock gating for that. You know, so that gives the ability for it to run independently of the rest of the machine you know, or be able to run at different ratios relative to a slice. Now, Within the fixed function blocks, and I'll go through this in a little bit more detail in a second, you know, that we've added some enhancements. We're probably, one of the biggest ones was adding uh, ABC encoder, which uh, provides a low power, low latency encoding that can be used for, uh, um, you know, uh, performance uh, for latency sensitive or uh, power critical applications. You know, we've also added, you know, additional uh, decoder and encoder support for more standard JTBC, VPA, you know, motion JPEG, and the raw imaging capabilities. So I want to just uh, jump ahead and talk about the different blocks and, and how they participate. So there are really, you know, up until this point in uh, uh, Gen 8, two main fixed function blocks. There's the multi-format codec, which has the, the encoder and decoder support in it. Now we added a uh, full fixed function support for HEVC decode into that block. And we also added support for doing uh, VP8 and HEVC encode, not where the entire encoder is in the block itself, but it's split between using this block to do the pack or the, the variable uh, bit length uh, operations, and then using the execution units and the media sampler in the main block in, in the slice to do the rest of the encoding operation. But just having the uh, um, the pack support for VP8 and HVC makes it possible to offload all of that work from the CPU. Now, and, and then I mentioned that we already had um, added the ABC encode support. Now on the, the video quality engine block, we added a bunch of functionality there, a 16-bit processing path, uh, five by five uh, spatial denoise filter, support for doing a, a local adaptive contrast enhancement to improve the the, to do a you know, better job than a global contrast enhancement algorithm on, on the uh, resulting images. And then some camera processing features that you know, enables us to do much more uh, high quality, uh, high resolution raw camera processing. 
And then we added one complete new block, and this block is called SFC, and what that stands for is the uh, Scalar and Format Conversion en Engine. And what it does is it, it allows us to do inline format conversions and upscaling, uh, upscaling or downscaling of, of images. And why that's important is I couple that with the uh, decoder, for example, and that allows me to do additional high-quality video processing operations on the back end of the of the fixed function decoder, keep it all working in the unsliced and not have to light up the, the slice to do any of that processing, whereas before we might have had to use the high-quality scaler that was present in the media sampler. And so these, you know, contribute to uh, being able to get to these lower power scenarios. Now here, I don't really mean to spend a long time uh, on this. This is kind of the scorecard of what codecs are supported. And really what I'm pointing out is the new capabilities that have been added in Gen 9 to support uh, different encoders and decoders. And then uh, finally, what I wanted to talk about was a little bit more detail about what's going on with the uh, camera raw processing support as an example. So the idea here is that I want to take the you know, high quality 16-bit sensor data coming from a 4K60 camera and be able to uh, process, that, process that by doing uh, white balance, uh, uh, demosaic, and color conversion, gamma correction, um, any geometry correction, and, and uh, final color enhancement and be able to display that as an RGB image. And the, these new blocks inside the video quality engine you know, provide the capabilities to go do that at, you know, with the power performance that allows me to be able to process 4K60 in a mobile power envelope you know, with the, this set of fixed function blocks. Okay, the, the next big chunk I want to talk about, it, you know, we hardly ever talk about display, uh, mostly because we never have tech insights that they give us an hour to talk about things. So you know, now that we have the extra time, we'll talk a little bit about display because the display architecture itself is interesting. So what goes on in display, you know, is that I can break it up into four pieces. It has a memory interface, and you heard from Yuli this morning, you know, these high resolution displays and being able to do multiple, you know, high resolution pipes is, you know, adding a lot of uh, memory traffic. And so we have, it's a, you know, we have a, um, an architecture that supports a, you know, high amount of bandwidth coming into the display subsystem. And there's a front end that really has to sort out requests for different formats and, and, and get them sequenced and you know be able to deal with uh, rotated displays or versus non-rotated and make sure that the, the requests are coming out in the right order. And then there's a, a, a bunch of individual blocks that handle the display pipe. And I'll talk about those in a little bit uh, more detail in a minute. But in the display pipes, th this is really uh, performing um, format conversion, compositing multiple planes together, uh, uh, doing any final color conversion and scaling the result for the pipe. And then the final piece is the pipes connect to the port encoders, and the port encoders, you know, convert to HDMI or uh, Display Port or, or or whatever the uh, the important standard is uh, uh, going to the connector. Now in Gen 9, you know, so we've had this basic architecture that's been evolving, you know, across all the generations of products that we've been doing. You know, we've been increasing the number of pipes and the resolution that each pipe could support and then the capabilities within a pipe itself. Now within uh, Gen 9, there's a few features that we added for the individual pipes. One was the uh, uh, lossless render target compression, being able to consume that directly by the pipe and not have to do extra conversions on that operation. Uh, you know, and generally speaking, being able to directly read anything that media or 3D generates is an important thing in display and not have to do extra processing um, that would sort of defeat some of the optimizations that might happen. So also being able to deal directly with swizzled surfaces that you know, we internally call wide tiled surfaces, um, being able to deal with uh, uh, 90 or 270 degree rotation on the fly, you know, it's really important in, in mobile form factors, and then increasing the quality of the scalers. You know, and again, all of this gets wrapped up in the trying to optimize for power. So, you know, isolating uh, individual uh, pipes to a single power well and being able to run with just one pipe on and run it in the lowest possible configuration, minimize the amount of leakage uh, is important. And we've also done some, some work to support, uh, you know, other C states like C9 and be able to put display in the lowest power modes. So now, uh, jump back and just talk about the uh, the display pipe 
and what's going on in there for a second because you know this is one of the areas that we've been evolving that this had come from you know some of the operating system vendors that said hey you know we've been doing this desktop composition where you know we've been taking individual windows and running the the um, uh, 3D pipeline to go composite the, the windows together. How about if we just do some of that in hardware and do that by having hardware planes that can map directly to windows and then we'll have a compositor in the hardware that just uh, alpha blends and does some scaling and color conversion to, to produce the final result. You know, the most top with uh, um, uh, video sources. And this is very um, similar to, you know, the original evolution of what happened with overlay planes. It's, these are like the deluxe overlay planes that uh, are not your father's overlay planes. So what we've done in Gen 9 was, you know, we've added the capability to have three independent planes and they get uh, uh, um, uh, plus a background color and they get composited or uh, um, their visual priority is done in a fixed order. So the highest priority one is, is plane three, you know, the lowest priority one is the background and they can be alpha blended together, color corrected, and then dithered or, or clipped, uh, depending on the, the uh, color format. And then um, from a scaling uh, operation perspective, or functionality perspective, there are two high quality scalers that are uh, seven by five. Uh, um, and one of those scalers, uh, or each of those scalers can be independently bound either to the output of the, uh, of the display pipe at the, right after the color correction stage, you know, or to an individual plane. So I could take two scalers and bind them to two different planes or one scalar to a plane and, and uh, one to the color output. And so these are you know, really there to support, for example, Microsoft's MPO uh, multi-plane overlay feature for Android and the uh, Surface Flinger. Yeah, and this is something where you know, we've done a, a reasonably healthy step over what we had in the, in the display backend for, for Gen 8. Now this is similar to the codec uh, scorecard. This is kind of the scorecard for what display pipes can do. That you know we support uh, wired internal display with uh, uh, embedded display port, external wired displays with display port 1.2 or HDMI 1.4 or with a dongle or up converter LSPCon is what we call it. You can go to uh, HDMI 2.0. And then we also support wireless uh, uh, mirror cast with uh, um, the Intel wide eye improvements. And you know, on the the right hand side is the max resolutions that we support. You know that th these are sort of what the architecture defines uh, that products are capable of doing, and then you know, what the is available in each SKU will depend on those definitions. Okay, the final thing that I want to talk about is the platform itself. And Yuli went through some of this this, this morning, but a bunch of it's really important to graphics, so I want to point it out again. So I mentioned in the end slice that we have the the interface to the fabric, and this is what we call GTI, and that has, um, you know, the, the throughput and latency coverage in that is really important to the performance of the machine, and as we build these larger machines with three slices, it's important for us to increase the throughput and the amount of latency coverage in there. But it's also important for the rest of the system to pony up more bandwidth and uh, make sure that it has sufficient latency to cover, cover the, the external DRAM systems or ED DRAM. And so Yuli mentioned uh, this morning, you know, that they had, uh, you know, essentially doubled the, the throughput through that fabric, you know, and that, you know, uh, um, those enhancements allow us to do a couple different things. Like one is we can get the same throughput, um, uh, um, at, you know, at, the, at a reduced frequency to what we had before, which improves the um, power in the system and we could apply that power to something else, you know, or there are cases where we need much higher throughput, you know, I can do that without adding a whole lot of power to the system. The other thing that's really important about this is that that fabric sort of scales with the number of cores and by increasing the throughput, you know, it gives us more capabilities with the two core systems than what we would have with four core systems. And you had noted that uh, in one of the things that we had done in Broadwell uh, was that we had added uh, uh, two core GT3 configuration. Now it's important that we make sure that if we're putting bigger graphics with a smaller number of cores, the fabric has to be able to provide the right bandwidth and latency coverage to be able to drive the graphics. And so Skylake does, does, does make improvements there, which sets the stage for, um, for, for uh, additional configurations. Now the other thing Yuli mentioned was uh, uh, about changing the configuration of EDRAM, you know, so that it's now a memory side cache instead of a victim cache. 
And there's a couple reasons that that was important for graphics. You know, probably the single biggest one, you know, I already just talked about the multi-plane overlay and the ability to be able to deal with um, window, window content directly in display without going through a, a compositor. So that means that we'd like to be able to render directly to uh, window content and be able to read it in the display system. And we don't want to have to deal with uh, complications about, well, can it be cached in EDRAM or not be in EDRAM or LLC? And by making it so that um, the display can get at EDRAM, you know, which it couldn't previously, that gets rid of some, one of the problems you know, with being able to flexibly, flexibly be able to use uh, window content with, uh, um, with the display system. And then Yuli had also mentioned that uh, um, we've done some things, again, because display is becoming a bigger and bigger consumer of bandwidth, having it play nicely with the rest of the system, with the CPUs and with the ISP, and you know, having better protocols for requesting bandwidth was important. So we've made some improvements there. And last but not least is adding support for uh, DDR4 and being able to run that uh, 2133. You know, the, you know, it goes without saying that graphics can use every bit of bandwidth that we can get. You know, we want EDRAM, we want all of the DRAM bandwidth, we want multiple ranks, we want multiple channels, you know, um, you know, and so having that support on the platform is really important for us. <clears throat> okay, so now I'll just <laughs> quickly summarize what I uh, talked about, and uh, then we'll have some time for, for questions. So, again, like I kind of went through quickly through a lot of material, you know, and really what uh, Gen 9 is, it's a, it's a large step function for us in terms of scalability and performance. And I didn't really even spend any time talking about things like the, the uh, C9 improvements or you know, efficiency improvements that also contribute to the performance, but there's lots of work that happened there as well as just making things be bigger. Um, you know, that we added a lot of uh, uh, compute performance and visual features. I didn't go through every single feature that we added. I just tried to pick some highlights like the you know, support for preemption or compression or um, you know, why not? You know, and then we'd also made these uh, quite large investments in improving low power media, you know, particularly with uh, these improvements on uh, support for the HEVC decode and ABC encode, and also for the camera raw support. And then finally, you know, we'd gone through and talked about the, you know, the work that had happened in the display pipes themselves and being able to um, both big drive uh, higher resolution, but it would be able to do it more flexibly and with greater power efficiency. So I think, you know, really the summary is, Best thing we built yet, greatest thing ever. Really want you to go. Very excited for you to go in and try it and tell us what you think. You know, and look for more for us in the in the future. Now, I have a 